Rahul, it's nice to have you here after a cup of tea which hopefully has opened up some of us. It's certainly, I'm feeling awake all the way. The session is on skills in IT, ICT and suddenly I feel it's very interesting because we rarely discuss skills in India. You know, we are a top heavy country in which we keep discussing IITs and doctors and brain drain and foreigners. We have 1.2 billion people and we have a Prime Minister who talks about make in India and creating jobs at a level that is not necessarily about PhDs and MBAs. And yet, um, forget about solving the problem, we are very often we don't even know what's the <coughs> level of gaps or requirements in making hundreds of millions of people employed because you've been historically a graduation degree oriented culture for various historical reasons that I won't discuss today. But when I say top heavy, that should send a signal. What we'll do today is to try and take note of the skill shortage in general. And with a particular emphasis on ICT, we have telecom and the explosion of internet and mobile and of uh, course convergence into media industry I belong to. So, but it's always my aim to get a big picture out so that we can zero in on better to locate ourselves in the context that we are in and then see how we could uh, take things forward. So I'd like to start with Dilip Chennai, who's my own, my old friend, who used to be in the, what used to be called the Association of Indian Engineering Industry, which became the Confederation of Engineering Industry, then later became the Confederation of Indian Industry. It has been a big growth for us in our respective possessions and professions, watching each other. But I think somewhere along the way he was in the Automobile Association, and then Suddenly, I find Bhubesh here at the area from India is telling me that he's done wonders in the National Skill Development Corporation. So, I first like to hear a bit more about what the NSDC does. It's one of India's best kept secrets, I'm told. And then tell us about the gaps as you see it and how far you've gotten in this journey of trying to build the gap. So, I think. Uh, the National Skill Development Corporation was created uh, in response to industry stating that uh, we can't employ the people uh, that we want to. Uh, and secondly, when we go to the university and college and IT and system, we find that the people who are coming out of that place are not able to be employed. We spend a lot of money on training. And third, we don't have a role to play in the skill uh, or training development space. So in 2008, uh, based uh, on the Paralysis Council of Trade and Industry, uh, they decided to set up a public private partnership uh, to enable Industry One to set standards, uh, assess and train people, yeah. and we actually lead the whole space of uh, training and development in the country. So. <coughs> What happened at that point of time, we reached out uh, to different associations, 10 associations partnered uh, with the government and the 51% equity in NSDC is held by industry associations, FICI, CII, ASOCHEM and 7 sectoral associations and uh, we manage a fund from the government to help uh, entities train. The task given to NSDC was to skill 150 million people by 2022. Uh, we were launched on the 20th of uh, October 2010 by the current president when he was uh, finance minister. And the way we actually started doing it, we, we, we threw the ball back in industry sport. So, NSDC does not know what's let's say happening in the telecom sector. If I want to know anything that's happening in the telecom sector, I go to General Kocher or if it's in the IT sector, I turn to Sandhya Chintala. Or if it's the auto sector, I turn to Sunil Chandravedi, who have actually created one of the sector skill councils. These uh, sector skill councils, and actually the architect of the telecom sector skill council is sitting right here in front of us. And the first uh, officially CEO is actually Kuro's behind him. 
So, these gentlemen, these gentlemen know more about it than I do, but all we did in NSDC was get the experts to get together and actually uh, do three things. One, for the first time, they have actually mapped the jobs in the, in the telecom sector or the IT sector. Mm -hmm. And they've got career, career pathways. Mm -hmm. And they define standards. Mm -hmm. So the idea was that by 31st of March 2015, for the 31 sector skill councils that we have, 80% uh, of the entry level jobs will be matched. So if you're a parent and you're looking at what are the job opportunities in the, in the country, uh, you would think it's a boy, engineer, girl, doctor, and if you are somewhat little bit of a child accountant or something like that, but nobody would think of any other uh, job role there because we don't know. So the idea was to create uh, career pathways and to communicate with the uh, wider audience on what are the opportunities available. At the same time, getting industry to say, okay, you lay down the standards. Uh, what are the standards that are required in various aspects of the job, from a PhD to PhD, so it's not only in one level. Okay. Um, and then uh, work with the training institutions to actually get their curriculum online, create a system by which you go and assess and certify, and uh, then you help people employ. So that's the theory. What's actually happened over the past uh, four years, the first year, 2010, the NSCC ecosystem. Uh, again, NSCC does not pay directly. We ask training providers to come up, give us proposals for 10 years for training, and then they give us proposals, we approve them, and we fund. We are somewhat like the old ICICI, IDBI, okay. the finance model, uh, which is 6% interest rate, 3 to 4 year moratorium, 10 year repayment period. Mm -hmm. So we have approved about 164 training partners, or 100 are on the ground. First year they trained uh, 20,000, second year 1,85,000, third year 4 lakhs, last year it was 10 lakhs, and this year the target is 33 lakhs. Also, that means in a gap of 5 years, nearly 15 million people will be skilled. Uh, it will be roughly about uh, 9 million people. No, oh, sorry. Yeah. How come 9 million? You said six, 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 50 lakhs, you said? No, no. Oh, sorry. Oh, I meant, yeah. sorry, okay. a million. Yeah. Okay. okay, sorry. Right. Maybe I'm putting okay. a wish list. And, and, yeah. yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, the 31 sector skill councils that we've approved have actually done 879 job roles. And in 12 sectors, 80% of the entry level jobs have been covered. So there's a new ecosystem that is actually happening. Uh, we ran a program last year to encourage the certification. And again, general poacher, two lakhs, two twenty. Two twenty. So we, the, the whole target was to actually in, enroll and certify ten lakh people. Uh, the first thing we did was we actually said that there's going to be a high failure rate. So the fourteen lakh people were enrolled, fourteen lakh people were in, uh, assessed, and it was a monetary reward scheme and a certification scheme which was actually uh, going on. Uh, so. 2,611 centers, 444 districts of India, and that's the spread. So I was right, you know, it is one of India's most untold stories. If you look at the fact that it's an organization which is less than five years old as we speak, that the statistics uh, tell a lot. Uh, so that's great work, Dilip. But I, towards the end of what you said, you were saying about the failure rate is high. Did I hear you say that? And we must know why, because you'll never hear of somebody at a higher degree level talking about that. No, you know, the, the challenge here is it actually stemmed out of, you know, Kiran Karnik's famous North quoted statement that only 25% of engineers are employable. In fact, yeah, so, we keep saying so, unemployment is not the problem, unemployability is So, the if you look at the McKinsey, the McKinsey study which they talked about, they said that 83% of the educational institutions believe that their people are employable. Whereas only 53% of the uh, employers feel so. So there's a break between the world of work and the world of education. Yeah, the proof of the recruit is in the work. So yeah. the other thing is that people don't understand, you know, they're creating competency standards. Competency standards are three things, knowledge, mm -hmm. skills and attitude. Mm -hmm. So if you look at skills, you know, it's like mm -hmm. if you got to, you know, let's say uh, do a well, right? You have to do a well 100 times correctly, 100 times, times every day, day and out. There's no 90% or 60% pass mark. Mm. So that's a competency based assessment. So, you know, if you, and in the telecom sector and all of them have kept their uh, uh, their passes. I think General Coach will be better placed to answer that yeah, question. Yeah, we'll, I think, we'll, we'll come I, to I that, think, I'm sure. But it's interesting because the, the important, the last thing you said, you know, the knowledge, competence, yeah. and uh, 
attitude At, attitude all are extremely important at a certain level it's it's good for every job even the, from the prime minister and the ceo downwards but at a certain level where it's scalable in millions of people it's a very critical issue and the other interesting thing i noticed is that we need to verticalize you know the way the nsdc is structured the verticalization is the way we are going to solve the problem with some very strong industry level interaction both at the curriculum defining level and also at the delivery level so that as i said the proof of the recruitment is in the work so that's interesting but let's let's get focused on ICT we have both these gentlemen here uh, to my right who are heavily telecom and ICT focused so let me begin by talking to let let me general speak coach you know telecom is an exploding industry already has seen a lot of growth so you know the demand in, you know the supply probably had to catch up with the demand in a more <laughs> visible sense so how did you see the problem when you took over when did you exactly take the over and how exactly are you going about it? what are the various uh, sub verticalization do you see in your industry uh, i took over in january this year and uh, i took over a organization whose foundation has been made very strongly by uh, people like rajan maitre and uh, commodore jena the processes and uh, the procedures which they laid down were extremely robust and uh, with the lip chennai support i can uh, the, uh, the it, it became easier for me to just uh, keep it keep the thing rolling mm-hmm. Uh, as we went along we learned the full lessons mm-hmm. and uh, the major lesson was that we have to take the industry along mm-hmm. like commodore jena keeps reminding me we are of the industry by the industry and for the industry so uh, the manner in which we work is that uh, we go back to the industry and then in interact and find out what is the prospective plan for the next 5 to 10 years uh, what happens actually is on ground the industry is so much embroiled in the day to day work mm-hmm. they they really do not have time for drawing your perspective plan and telling you there is yeah they in narayan murthy's famous word they live qsqt quarter se quarter tak this is a fact um, but uh, still from our uh, council members we do get a lot of guidance and from uh, industry bodies we get a lot of guidance and we know what technology is coming in and then we interpolate and then we have committees good committees have been set up by my predecessor three committees have been set up and we take our formulations to that mm-hmm. this is what we perceive is going to be the demand in the telecom sector in the next few years and uh, accordingly yeah. then we convert that into job roles mm-hmm. and the job roles get converted with their help into syllabi mm-hmm. and once the syllabi is endorsed by them in writing Mm-hmm. and uh, we if we require an endorsement of about 70% of the industry as per the industry guidelines then we go back and we can get it getting endorsed and published as national occupational standards oh. and then the clutch of these national occupational science standards become a QP, qualification path and we then start skilling using our training partners to be nice yeah actually i need to spend more time in you know, all this sounds nice but a lot of it is like a planning document or a blueprint no it's actually, uh, actually happening like that it's actually yeah, I know. but i'm very keen to know a little bit more about how you actually made it happen or make it happen you know the training partners are at this moment they haven't entered the stage in this game Uh, not yet. So yeah, there is one sitting on the extreme right. Yeah, I'll come to that. In fact, I was saying, you know, the hero always comes in later in the movies. You know, uh, uh, so uh, oh, once we start with the training provider, where mm-hmm. uh, we find that initially we did find some of the problems that the quality standards of various training providers were different. <laughs> Obviously, in any environment, it will be good, bad, ugly. Everybody will be there, but it was for us to ensure that the quality assurance levels are met. because what we deliver to the student has to be of the right uh, time which makes him employable or which gets him a livelihood mm-hmm. you said that you are the target that the government has said was skilling 500 million so we are not going to ever create 500 million uh, jobs in this much of period so people have to get into entrepreneurship it is a very important part of uh, skilling mm-hmm. get skill for a job but if you want to be an entrepreneur you should have them get into entrepreneurship yeah what in the good old days used to be called self employment Yeah, in fact, I'm a, I admire some of the mobile repair men I go to. They've probably not even been to high school, but they're as cool as my public school niece. And 
uh, that's a tribute to Indian, uh, what I call the street genius. Uh, but the question is how we can systematize them so they also know a bit of the theory so that they have standards and procedures. Do you do something about that, sir? What? Uh, the standards and procedures yeah. at the level of, you know, can a, what you would call a blue collar skilled person be made in a short span of time aware of the systematic nature of the skill. Whatever we are doing, whatever the syllabi we are writing is outcome based. It is not output based. Mm -hmm. And it is not a academic training. You only do outcome based. Uh, what is he going to do on the job? That is what the skill is skilling on. Mm -hmm. so of necessity, what most of our courses are 30 days duration, 120 hours duration. And uh, <coughs> it is at least 50 percent on the job, on the on the equipment. So he's actually learning how to operate the equipment or how to do the job that he's uh, skilling for, and not the theory behind it. Yeah, that's right. In fact, I was uh, meeting my family guru yesterday and he was quoting the Gita and Sanskrit, you know, Abhyasena Kaushalam, apparently. <laughs> skill, the practice brings skills. So this is particularly true because you're not drawing just blueprint. So, but you have a complete hand-holding process in that? We yeah. have. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the Telegram Sector Skill Council, after getting a group from our council, uh, what we have done is uh, we've gone to the extent of you know, helping them get employed post certificate. Mm -hmm. That is not our charter. Our charter finishes officially at certificate, you know, in employment. But we have gone beyond that. We have tied up with your organization, the Chinese mm -hmm. government, you are the first to do it, mm -hmm. where uh, we are uh, giving all our certificate holders, unless they say we don't want to be on China uh, and asking China to help place them. Uh, and also carry the message forward that the air is where the telecom professionals are available. It's helping us a lot. In the last uh, uh, two months, we had at least uh, six advertisements in print media. In fact, I saw a bus stop yes, advertisement yesterday about advertising a call center number for a uh, career. So that's something nice because we that's need... Use, that's use of ICT yeah. in skills. So, you know, we, we very interesting. We had a choice to do a toll-free number mm -hmm. or a missed call. So the consensus was do a missed call. Uh -huh. So we, you know, when we started this program, uh, some... After all, we are the country that invented the missed call as a product. Biggest, <laughs> biggest, biggest innovation. Innovation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we started this in, in, in January, February, earlier this year, people told us if we get 600 calls a day, we'll be very lucky. And uh, we, were, we, we were advertising this call center number and suddenly we got to 18 to 20,000 calls a day. And luckily the polls were announced. So, you know, it was seen as, it might have been seen as a... Electoral uh, gimmick? As, as an electoral gimmick, so we withdrew the ad. And then again, we now we have used the same number of call center seats, but used IVR technology. Uh, and between the 2nd of October to the uh, 6th of uh, November, we've got close to 8 lakh calls. And these calls are automatically getting routed to the nearest training partner to that call. Wow. And, and you know, we are trying to get uh, very interestingly in the first pilot which we did in January, February, there was 30% conversion rate from a call to actually joining a program. That's amazing. That's much and better than your credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask you, uh, this is the time to ask you, do you function on a profit model for this? Or? So NSDC as such is a not-for-profit organization, but the entities that we fund can be for-profit or not-for-profit. Uh, it's up to them. Uh, now, you know, being a not-for-profit organization doesn't mean that you can't make revenue. Yeah, okay. you can just have to flow it back. You just have to flow it back and I yeah. think that's what the Telecom Sector Skill Council is actually uh, doing. Mm -hmm. But um, we've, we've actually integrated everything onto an IT backbone. Mm -hmm. So from the time of recruitment, if you want to get into a batch, you get enrolled on the, on the uh, IT system, mm -hmm. then the Telecom Sector Skill Council like, assesses, puts an assessor the assessor uploads the result. Mm -hmm. The result is on the system uh, based on Aadhaar number and bank account. Uh, a certificate is generated. The certificate has got a 3D barcode which can be read by a phone app. So you can verify the certificate anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's all on a database. Currently about 3.2 million such uh, data and close to about 800,000 certificates on the database. It's all IT based. Mm -hmm. So there's no human intervention. I can't decide whether you know the guy is passed or not. I can't intervene in the system. It's all it's all there. 
That's fantastic. Interesting. Uh, but and the most interesting part in this I see it is that it's not skilling as in the conventional education sector. It's almost like you're solving a human inventory problem on the fly, almost. And therefore, it has a special quality to it. But uh, no pro better person uh, than Bhupesh Daheria to tell us a bit more about this. I always had one problem in trying to understand Bhupesh uh, in the sense that I've seen him uh, either face problems or see opportunities in the way the telecom sector is panning out. And someday he seems like a messiah to the industry. Some days he seems like, you know, poor chap, he's invested so much time. What is the industry doing to him? That's because I've known him and I've been on the jury of the Gramble Awards earlier. So the real question, Gopesh, is that how is the industry really handling this? Uh, you know, I heard Colonel Coach, uh, Colonel Coach saying something about the fact that the industry does not know what it wants. Right. So, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just trying to, I'm a journalist, I'm supposed to provoke. Uh, the industry knows but don't want to contribute. Yeah, it's like this, there is a there is a communication gap of sorts in the communication industry. So I'm trying to learn from you what is the nature of this thing and how have you perceived it and how you've tried to solve because AGs has been pioneer in the way a verticalized training and skill development has gone on in the ICT industry. So I'm trying to see, uh, looking back at your experience and the state of play. So we have always been in higher education. So my experience was never with the vocation And if I go back to my personal experience, I didn't enjoy it from starting to the <coughs> My experience was often higher. And I have never been to the When I'm going to offer the demand, we are just realizing that optical time is there, so they can all the slight rate moves over there. It was all the situation. That's it. This is what I'm going to I didn't enjoy it often that it company and first day I entered into the plan and I saw the optical fiber. Mm -hmm. I literally touched it and closed my eyes for two minutes. I said wow, I got the moksha <laughs> because for this optical fiber I got the job. I studied it, I didn't understand anything. Right? <laughs> so this is the state of the education <coughs> which is primarily driven by the industry, uh, driven by the government. So government has uh, absolutely mapped up the education, right? Like I, then again I'll take you to different angles. I used to run a company called G4 Testing. I recruited candidates from around 250 Indian colleges from across the country. Every year we used to test something around 100,000 candidates. McKinsey says 15 to 20%, my selection rate was 3%. For companies like TCS, Hexavier, TAC so and all. Selection rate was horrible. Right. The product which is coming out is horrible. Then again, let's go back to the government. And these skilling programs are running for the last 60 years, right? The problem with these skilling programs that you can create Mr. Ramlal, Mr. Kalulal at your home, upload the Excel sheet, train them on paper, get them certified on the paper, take the money. And this has been going on for the last 60 years. Okay. And I was very skeptical because a lot of times I got uh, chances to get involved in these kind of training and okay let's keep our hands out of this because there's no process mm -hmm. because people are making ma money in the air and once I saw this uh, once like around three years back I met Dilip Shinoy then I met um, Rajan Matthews and then I got really excited and then met uh, Jana Hubs and I saw that yes they have created the processes and process is foolproof you cannot create a Ramlal and Kalulal because they are linked with the Aadhaar card. The money goes to the candidate once he clears the examination. Means you are supposed to train them. So my entire OPEX has gone them to train them. And I get only fun fall when I do the good karma. <laughs> okay, so if there is a mishap in the karma, I lose my entire money. So the audit trail is very well mapped yes, out, right. which is good. And then even in the training, there is a substantial portion is devoted on the uh, and so on, right? I'll give you the example like in uh, we trained a candidate from uh, uh, DY Patel, Bharti Vidya Peet. Good intuition. In DY Patel, I have 35 faculty members and their average is 40 and they have enrolled for the optical fiber splicing program. 
because they have been training for last 20 years and they have never seen the optical fiber or a slicing machine or those stuff. So I was surprised. On the other hand, in Bharti Vidya Peet, there are around 40 faculty members enrolled for the mobile repair course. They don't want to make careers in mobile repair. Right? And the faculty member who was teaching them, this guy is a, I guess, 17 year old kid. Because you don't get mobile repair guy with 40 years and 20 years experience. Mm -hmm. So the experience was amazing. They have created a wonderful process, foolproof process. The third party is going to audit. You have to really train them, give them the real skill, interface with the industry. So this is, this is the first time I, I saw that, yes, this is, this is a wonderful platform. You guys are really doing good. And if this continues for next 10 years, we'll see a different face of this country. This is interesting. Actually, we hear a lot of good news, but I think it's always, I'll come back to you on the, the modalities of how this thing can be taken forward because whatever has happened has been good because it's like a blueprint with some early stages. But we'll come back to how we can actually scale it in a magnificent way. But I must check out Luxra of, of Chief Technologist, uh, Chief CTO of Technology Services in Hewlett Packard. Lux, tell us about how your experience has been, you know, does HP, uh, do you from the demand side face problems? Yeah. Uh, if so, what kind, how would you define the way things are and perhaps because you work for a global company, benchmark <coughs> India against others in terms of the way they do it, let's say East Asia or China. Absolutely. Uh, I can't agree more to whatever was reflected over here. In terms of you know the employability readiness factor of uh, engineers coming out of college, 53% uh, is a number, but I would say that you know their level of understanding actually in terms of you know industry knowledge today is uh, probably a little low. They're not ready yet. Uh, it's also because of the rate of change of information. You know, technology is actually you know really you know going at a lightning pace, and uh, academy has actually still you know really caught up in the syllabus of uh, your so. Hypothetically, if I take up engineering, an engineering student and ask him or her about cloud computing, they'll have a lot of hands going up actually giving academic explanations of what cloud computing is all about. But a practical perspective which industry needs today and now is completely missing. Mm -hmm. So I would reckon actually that industry readiness factor is actually missing. While this is actually the state of you know, higher level of professional education, now coming to the skills part, you know, because obviously this is actually going to you know, percolate down to the skills as well. At HP, we started off a program called, you know, it is not publicized, you won't have heard about it, it's called, you know, uh, Learning to Livelihood. Mm -hmm. The whole idea was to actually... Let me stop you a bit, is this a corporate social responsibility initiative or is it a core to your function? Uh, well, actually, you know, I'll tell you what, interestingly, it started off as a responsibility factor, but then we built in technology to make sure that, you know, whatever we are doing as part of the CSR is also about, you know, cutting edge technology, to use an euphemism. We put in all the technological aspects and I'll actually elaborate a little bit about the solution. So uh, we, we, we felt that, you know, the learning to livelihood part is something that we will help uh, people, you know, to understand better and all that. And for a country like India, how are you going to actually, you know, scale the skill? Okay, you don't have that many people who can train and so on. So while I think, you know, kudos to actually some really cool uh, initiatives taken by Mr. Jana on this, aspect, you know, training that many number of people is actually a logistics nightmare, but then they have achieved actually, you know, something uh, unthinkable in a very short span of time. How do we scale this, you know, enormously now? Technology, I uh, was actually heartened to hear about the IT backbone that is, you know, really, you know, automated the whole process so that there, is, there can't be, yeah. So, uh, so uh, this, how do we actually, you know, scale the skills initiative? Uh, IT will automate the whole process and so on. IT will also actually help in you know, reaching out and in, into into this becoming an ubiquitous kind of a program, you know, available everywhere through connect, through context, and the relevant content to actually the person who is seeing it. So you're talking about e-learning. Uh, I'm talking about e-learning, but with actually a slightly a slight flavoring, and I'll explain that to you. Mm. You build an actually this mass skill movement, you know, uh, through the program that's actually driven by the Star Initiative, and then. How do you actually make sure that hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people will get, a, you know, uh, will will get the benefit of this program? You've got the training partners over here. Now we want to actually offer a technology platform. The previous panel talked about, you know, how video today is actually the new norm when it comes to communication. Mm -hmm. If you are able to actually crystallize the normal aspects of these training programs from the great gurus themselves and have it available in context of the viewer who is actually seeing it at his time or her time, then you have actually delinked dependencies. 
you're making sure that actually a device such as a smartphone with the connectivity that is actually being you know talked about all through you will be able to provide someone at the cost which is lesser than a cup of coffee something that will make his life good that's right i ag agreed but there are two or three problems i see in this i'd love to tackle this from our fellow panelists the first problem is of course uh, making sure that the training partners are right because he was talking about uh, big data and analytics and I've seen auto rickshaws in Noida with the uh, advertisement saying they'll teach big data. <laughs> I will never know because I'm seeing this new idea advertisements on TV in which uh, a kid uses mobile phone to find out if this course is certified or not. So we have a genuine problem of, you know, if on Wall Street you have financial security problem, here you have education related reality check issues. Uh, I presume you're solving that to make sure that the certification. Yeah, I'm constantly doing it, and I. Uh, yeah, I think I'd love to hear uh, Coach Sal talk about this. Uh, we did take approvals from both MSDC and our uh, council before we embarked on uh, ambitious project, and that is how he's saying we are flowing back our revenue. Now, the problem that we were facing is that the quality of content which is going to the student is not uniform, despite our best of efforts. Yeah. Uh, he is one training provider, there is another chap who is sitting in Chennai, third chap sitting in Agartala. They are passing the benchmark content, but what they are teaching on ground is different. Because the quality of instructors which are available in rural areas cannot match up with the quality of instructors which are available in the urban areas. Yeah, I think that's the point I was getting towards. In fact, this so is we a... have found a solution to that. Yeah, what's that? Uh, what? There are one or two things you must understand. One is the content, quality of content. Second is the delivery. And third is the language a person understands. And fourth is keeping the assessor and the assessee away from each other. Because that is something that has happened in the past and it has been a very bad In experience. other words, he says we shouldn't have corruption. Yes, we should not have corruption. <laughs> Plain English. Yes. <laughs> so what we have done uh, in the Telegram Sector Skill Council is that uh, we have got the content created and it is uh, it is an Indian movie, let me say, like what uh, he is saying. Uh, we are trying to engage as many senses of a person as we can. That's right. So we've got uh, his visual senses engaged by putting simulators, graphics, something which catches his eye and ear. And we've got text, and the text is only in two languages. Wow. We've, got, we've tied up with partners who can convert this into 20 to Indian language. It's not sufficient for us. Why is it not sufficient? Because the person who is sitting in a village, he is not interested in, uh, say, the particular language of that state. He is interested in the dialect, which he understands. Absolutely. Okay. So therefore, what we have done is we have done a, a, a master instructor led who sits in a metro, in a studio, and he is transmitting the entire thing. He is teaching from a central location and he is being assisted at the other end by a person who understands the subject as well as the language. The Perfect. In fact, uh, uh, General Kosher has answered my question even before I raised it. I had saw. See, the point I was trying to get in was that uh, Lux was talking about the fact that new technology dramatically increases the possibility of, at low cost, delivering great educational content. But the important thing in this is not the content anymore because we are not teaching anthropology or sociology. <laughs> You're teaching skills, so the pedagogy itself has to be very different. And what General Kocher says is, I hope you enjoyed this presentation because, he, because the level of detail that one has to drill into for skills education as opposed to old fashioned degree education is very, because people need to be educated on a need to do basis. There are a few other aspects we need to be focused on. And, yes. uh, uh, one is that we must make the entity do what they are good at doing. Yeah. For example, a training provider, Rupesh. Uh, when he becomes a training provider, I tell him, you create content also, you teach also. No. And you get the infrastructure also. No, that is not being fair. He, if he is a, if he's a good training provider, he should concentrate on teaching. On scaling. People. I think the best way to example, this is like sport. You know, in sport you don't have teachers, you have coaches. Coach. So his, you know, his expertise, I presume, is in scaling. So therefore, we've gotten people who can, whose expertise is in creating content. So they will create the content. He will use that content. We will give them platform uh, by which it will be delivered, and that platform are five types: Android phones and tablets, web, 
satellite and satellite at DTH. Uh, I'm saying one way video, two way audio. So it reaches everybody. Wherever this all these countries, when we converted that into a CBT, and we also have a provision of giving it on uh, in a text format on a printed form. Okay. Oh, amazing! It's so this is these are the these are the building blocks that we are bringing up, and all this we are bringing bringing in competition. We are saying we will not give it exclusively to a person. We will partner with anybody who crosses our QA standards, so that there is fair competition and bring in quality. And we lower the price. Can I just change short, sir? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, oh, brilliant. You know, the way you are creating content, you are actually, you know, building in, you know, very compelling content, ensuring that quality standards are met. And I'll add a fourth C to contact, connect, and con uh, you know, content. Uh, so uh, here, the consistency part is actually something you are ensuring. You are building, you know, hundreds of millions of content, you know, and after a couple of years, you'll actually have a large volume of content available and then you'll have trainers who will be delivering it. How do we ensure that the best of content is actually delivered at the point of need to the right person, you know, at the relevant person? Yes. Yeah. So you're talking about precision targeting in, ad, uh, in education. That's amazing. <laughs> I, would have, I would have only thought even in advertising, it's a difficult problem to solve. So we have <laughs> reached that state, but what we have planned for yeah. is through a MCU, the master instructor and yeah. the facilitator are going to be in touch with each other. Yes. They are going to see each other face to face. Yes. Where they can't, at least on audio contact they will be there. And then we are giving the choice to the student yeah. to go to an infrastructure partner right. who's got infrastructure but he's not a training provider. He's invested huge capex yeah. in infrastructure or some other business, but he can make his infrastructure available to us. Yeah. And therefore, our student base can go there and do the contact program. Yeah, yeah. And after the contact program, they are assessed there itself using a platform which has yeah. uh, not only uh, the MCQs and the various other things, but it also has the a video. Content itself, it the also, video of the content. The video, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. It has got a video which is monitoring the student through a soft MCU, and we can see him in the studio. Back and there's a master assessor sitting in the studio who's actually doing the assessment. Now, I'll tell you something very interesting in this whole story is that the instruction, instructor needs to be as close as possible to the student, but the assessor needs a That's Chinese wall. <laughs> so it's a very interesting uh, puzzle and to be the solved. Main, the main feature of all this model that we're doing is that we don't own it. Mm -hmm. We go on it with partners. I haven't spent a single person on it. Oh, that's right. This is an asset light model, as we say in Silicon Valley. This is the it's like the Uber model, you know, which is much in the discussion, not for today's discussion, but like shine is a partner. Shine, yeah. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 If, if I get a raise next year, you know, I can have Colonel a general kosher time. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I have to ask Dilip about uh, a deeper question. You know, you were talking about training partners, the ecosystem, the monitoring and everything. But would you like to say something about the pedagogy itself? You know, skilling always has, you know, I heard a lot about interactive, in, intense, customized interaction, uh, what do you call, skill impartment framework. But how do you look at it at a stratospheric level to make sure that the details go well? You're like an Air Force pilot trying to get the infantry movement right. So I, actually the, the big challenge is if you see how the education system and the training system evolved over the past many years, it was supply side driven. Mm -hmm. So you know, you, you enroll people on the basis of the reputation of the institution, you train them according to the program that you thought was appropriate, uh, you got you assess them, certify them, and then the holy grail was a job fair. So everybody went to job fair, you got companies come in. So that's a supply side kind of model. How do you, we, what we try to do here is, is actually do a demand led model yeah. where you can uh, see that uh, you get uh, industry to their standards. And most training partners actually go and go to industry and say, okay, these are the standards you set. How many people do you want? We'll train to, you, train to your standards. We'll get them certified by people that you approve. So the whole thing has actually changed. And what, you know, the whole problem in this thing is, is an outcome, an out, you know, <coughs> outcome based system as General Kocher said. The mindset in everybody's mind in this training and, 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 and education space is how many hours has he sat down, you know, uh, what pedagogy has he looked at, uh, 
you know, and also you know, can we do formative assessments? That means assess, you know, something like a you know, continuous, comprehensive evaluation in class and not an examination. <coughs> so there's a mindset change that is happening. It's very difficult to actually tell people we are not bothered about, you know, how you develop the curriculum to teach. We'll, we will we'll, we'll say that okay, this curriculum is aligned, aligned to the standards, but. The testing is going to be based on the uh, competency base. So, you know, you can't say that this question is outside the course or we don't know something because that's the way it is. And that's the biggest challenge that we have. <coughs> and, you know, even everything which has come online, whether you take Coursera, you know, CEO was in town you know, just a few days ago, or edX or other things. These are actually taking existing programs and putting them online and then offering you a certification uh, based on that. Um, but that's not changing the model significantly. What, what General Kocher and the whole ecosystem here is doing is actually shifting the whole system. I mean, if you talk to, uh, if you, if you talk to the, the regulators in the engineering space, so, you know, NASCOM says that only 25% of the engineers are employable, but all engineers get employed. Cool. You know? But without seeing optic fiber cable, I think you know, we need a blog from you and we need to actually put that in. Uh, fascinating story. Uh, so the whole thing is actually, what good is pedagogy if you don't have touched optic fiber cable? We see the reality show like Dalak Diklaja on Skill Diklaja, you know, so that we could actually test people out. Sunday, <laughs> Sunday, do darshan 11 o'clock every week. One and one. Yeah. Oh, this, this is interesting. Is actually this on is television. Oh, I need to know more about it. Please, they also do. What's this? Is it's, 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 it's actually, uh, you know, it, it's a program, one hour program on skill development which has an inbuilt contest in a particular skill. See, I was joking about it, he's done it. Somebody should clap for this. <laughs> I mean, I thought I was thinking out of the box, he's done it out of the box. You know. 11 yeah. o'clock. And every Saturday is repeated at 1. So basically, you have skill testing on national TV. I mean, I would have never thought, you know, amazing. But that takes us to the biggest challenge of all, uh, scaling. And I want to ask Bhupesh about what are the technological options for scaling because he keeps talking to me about it. You know, it is M, uh, M Mobile University. A so lot of lot of IT solutions are available, right? But they all are proven for the higher education. Like we have launched Mobile University, we are training candidate telecom executives in around 35 countries, right? Faculties are sitting across the continent in North America, Europe, running fantastic. So. When Mr. Matthew, I met Mr. Matthew, Matthew says that we have to train around 10 million people. And to train 10 million people, you need to train 25,000. So the problem was uh, that if you have to train 10 million people, you have to train 25,000 teachers. I said, uh, 10 million I am not targeting. Let me think how we can really train 25,000 teachers. So we created this, uh, we modified the, this MOOC platform. And we said, okay, because the faculty is a major issue. And that I realized earlier, because I shifted my campus from Indore to Bombay in search of the better faculty, and Bombay partly could meet the requirements. So we said, okay, we'll record the content. So on mobile repair, one of the courses which we are training is mobile repair. So we recorded all the mobile repair courses based on the NSDC standards, okay? Although NSDC doesn't say that you have to use those video lectures or other stuff, but we created those. We wanted to see that on top 10 scale, we knew that these video lectures are not going to work, but let's see <coughs> if we can really use it on two scale or three scale because it's a hands-on. And surprisingly, like out of 3,000 candidates, at least 2,000 candidates visited the website and they saw the video. So one of my best viewed, view, viewed uh, video is not by the best of the professors on mobile, or on say billing or uh, uh, marketing, right? It was by a kid who's a 17 year old, okay? He has not visited the college himself, right? And he's training on Hindi, English. Oh, interesting. On mobile repair. Yep. And the views are 35,000. Amazing. So we created some uh, content which is inside our platform, some content which is on the YouTube. This is what I call it. And I was taken aback. This is like the remix, what remix did to music uh, can be done in education. You know, you can make it cool and you know, people yeah. will do it their own way. Hey, you got to understand, this is, this has got a very deeper connotation. Mm -hmm. You know, he's talked about mobile repair. We have very close to people who are teaching 
domestic help, right? How do you train domestic help? And the trainers there are really actually domestic help. So that you know, for the Canadian High Commission, the domestic help comes and trains there. The thing is that what we have understood is the communication between that 17-year-old or this domestic person who's actually working is much better than an experienced teacher and a student. Yeah, it's bonding. It's and more it's than just the, communication. And, and they know what's actually happening. Yeah. So, you know, we are, we are actually having a challenge here because the general thing is, oh, you require so many trainers, they've got to be you know, B-Eds and M-Eds and M-Techs and B-Techs. And you know, actually not there. It's a yeah. whole different way you can actually go. So, yeah, this is demystifying education, at the same time making it work even harder. Meaning, uh, smarter. Like the guy I have uh, who trained Ericsson guys, okay, those who have 10 or 15 years experience, my trainer, uh, he is not going to college. And this guy is one of the best trainer for the uh, optical fiber splicer. When I was in Optel, under me, there were technicians and they were simply IITs and they can beat any IIT, IIT, uh, IIT engineer. Mm. In terms of splicing, because that's right. IIT case. engineers are very good at selling soap, I've noticed. <laughs> yes. I'm not joking. But joking not because most of them make more item. money in Hindustan Lever or Unilever. No, no. I had little difference of opinion here. A person who's professionally good need not be a good trainer. That's true. In fact, yeah, I realized yeah, this in right. college where the right. person who that's didn't right. do a PhD was a better Absolutely teacher right. than. Yeah. So, what we have done, we, have in a, we made it mandatory for us that any training provider of TSSE will have to have certified trainers and certified assessors. We will not permit any training without certified trainers. This has become mandatory. So, you know, actually, very interesting. I got a call from the finance minister of West Bengal, who used to be a colleague in ah, Fiki, of course, of course. saying that, you know, NSDC has trained people. How many certified trainers that you have? So I said, we have certified trainers. I have 22,300 hot trainers. He said, can you give me a list? I said, five minutes. So I said, what? I said, five minutes. So I just went to the STMS. All of them have actually approved trainers, just downloaded them into an Excel format and sent it back to him. Hmm. And he calls me back and said, you know, someone else must be asked the question, so you I said, no, I just downloaded it from the system. And I thought you'll ask me that, give me West Bengal specific. He said, no, that I can do for the Excel sheet. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that's the, that's the difference that they're important. Really, what we've added to that is that uh, instead of teaching subject matter expertise, we added 60% pedagogy. Yeah. So 60% is pedagogy and only 40% is SME. That is very, very interesting. I think this is where the details look really lovely because the difference between this kind of skilling versus the conventional education is precisely this. This is the ratio of this to that has to be accurate. But I am not, you haven't answered my question, Bhupesh, okay. on yeah. how can we put this whole thing on steroids? Can mobile university or some of the technological platforms you're trying to create how, how good are, what are the potential and limitations in this? How, okay. how can you put instructors and as, instruction as, as together? As Kuchar Thap has said that they have created a platform, right? And our platform is a similar way there. You first have the master trainer who will train the further trainer, right? Because you don't have the same quality of the trainer everywhere, right? So you will find a good optical fiber slicer uh, in the Chhattisgarh, but probably he doesn't know the theory part, right? So you have to really make him a complete man, Raymond's man, right? So you, uh, you, you put the content, you push this content in a live environment wherein they can see the faculty, they can interact with them. At the same time, we have created the recorded content, which yeah. is available. Like, for example, we are training candidates for first source, uh, Ericsson, Vodafone, uh, Sarko, right? We have trained a lot of guys those who are there in the job for the last five to six years, in 10 years, and we recertified them. And there were a lot of missing gaps. We worked closely with the Vodafone. So we created the portal wherein all the content is there, which is in PPT, standards are there, uh, the video lectures are there in English and English both, right? So uh, we have not created in 26 language, but we have created in two language, English and English. And that's scalable. So on 10 scale, even if you are able to achieve on three or four, yeah, and the other thing is I like the way you mentioned English. It basically means that we have to break old rules of grammar to make communication more efficient and accessible so that the whole purpose is to create a practical environment. I like that, but I'm tempted to ask Lux, you know, you work for a multinational, you know, uh, do you have any best practice or information on what's happening in Korea or China or that India could adapt or we could do here or are we by any chance 
the way Dilip talks about it, that we could well be ahead of the curve in some ways as far as education is concerned. Yeah, from a technology point of view, you know, this is an India-based solution. We created the solution in India and I would like to talk about it a little bit, you know. I didn't want to really make it a solution pitch, that's why I didn't cover it. But now, since you asked the question, we've got a solution which is an algorithm that scours the net because the net has actually got, you know, immense amount of information, you know, provided by people. But that's actually like a viral rage, you know, mm. very few people know about it and you don't know. If you start searching for it, you'll get zillions of hits, you don't know where, what to look for. As we're speaking, every single minute, about 120 hours of programming is getting uploaded on channels like YouTube and stuff like that. Mm. People are uploading, there's a lot of good content out there, but it's also a black hole there. Now, you can't humanly actually curate all of that information because every minute is actually getting added. How do you create a sustainable model that can actually scour the vast expanse of video, both channels which actually, you know, he talked about, Ubish talked about, Kuchasop talked about, which is actually, you know, formal channels, but also actually complementing thing, which is holistic knowledge about the same content, and get an algorithm to do that work. It picks up a key text. That key text will actually then go and, you know, ping various sources of information or videos that are there. And those videos then will actually, you know, come side by side to your theoretical content. And as you're learning, if a new content has actually come up, two months down the line, you'll have a new content coming up. This is very interesting. That means you can making making education the way you watch songs on YouTube. Exactly. But if I'm listening to an old song by R.D. Burman, another song from R.D. Burman will show up. Yeah. But we are now doing to education what we enjoy casually in music, yeah. but the interesting part based on what uh, Bhupesh said earlier is that you can even add a social layer to it yeah. because there are certain people who like, <coughs> say somebody will learn it in Bhojpuri, somebody will learn it in English, English, yeah. and somebody will learn it in, you know, uh, the Dakhni part of, you know, in Hyderabad. Yeah. And people will choose their own coaches, so to speak, based on a clutter of videos. And, you know, you will choose, uh, you know, it's like, they say there are 10 versions of the Colaberry song. There may be 20 versions of how to fix an Android lollipop phone. You will create my favorites <laughs> of your own thing. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm sorry, we are really short of time, but any questions from the audience or any quick observations? Not too long. 